welcome to our new EMCDA webinar. This time we will talk about prisons and drugs. And I will give uh, directly the floor to our director, Alexis Guzdi, for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Marika. Uh, good morning, everybody, or hello, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to be with you today for, for this very important topic. Um, actually, as, uh, as some of you probably have heard me uh, saying a few times, uh, I think not only that is a, an extremely important topic, uh, it's also sometimes uh, I, I hear from the colleagues, the, the professionals working in that, uh, in that field uh, in the last 20, 30 years, that um, uh, unfortunately, uh, there have been no major changes in the way uh, we as uh, European countries, we address those issues. And um, for instance, we know, uh, I think one of the first seminars I have attended 30 or 35 years ago, when I started working on the drug field was about drugs and prison and about how important and critical and dangerous was the time of release. Uh, and the risk, uh, potential, potential risk of uh, uh, dying from overdose. And uh, honestly speaking, um, those changes in the last 30 years, there have not been so many. And clearly we can say it's not a question of lack of scientific evidence. So we need, we need to find different ways to raise the awareness and to, to push for change, to push for better and more appropriate uh, uh, responses. I think uh, still, uh, some element uh, that uh, can give us hope. Uh, first, um, our contribution uh, uh, to celebrate uh, or contribute to the uh, World uh, Day on Drugs uh, last week uh, was the launch of the publication that you see just behind me, Prison and Drugs in, in Europe. Uh, and I, I would like to, to thank and congratulate uh, Linda, all the colleagues of EMCDD, but also all the external partners of EMCDD who support us in this work, and we also try to support them. So uh, I have a first question for you to, uh, to, to send us all the suggestions, all the, the ideas you have, how the EMCDD could be more useful for you in the future. Uh, that's part of our mission. And that's part of what we are uh, trying to change and to further improve our CMCDDA in providing even better service to our customers. But certainly uh, to manage, uh, to, to publish, to finish, to prepare the insight, I think it was a lot of headaches uh, for Linda and the colleagues, uh, but uh, Linda, she never abandons. And that's another good example. And that's a fantastic result for EMCDDA. So, I think that's a very important achievement for all of us. But now we need to find a way to make use of it and, uh, and to make it now and to see how to make, use, uh, make it even more useful. So this webinar, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good opportunity and it's only the first one, the first opportunity. Uh, second, uh, very uh, recent and very positive development is that the last 21st of June was adopted the European Action Plan on Drugs. Uh, and, uh, and thanks to the efforts of uh, the Portuguese presidency of the EU. In fact, the action plan is translating into actions uh, and concrete activities, the objectives that have been defined in the European drug strategy that was adopted under the German presidency in December. And, and this, was, this process was initiated uh, by the presentation by the European Commission and the Commissioner Johansson of the, uh, what was presented as the European Agenda on Drugs that was presented last year. One thing very positive for those like you and us who work in this field is the fact that uh, for the European Union, uh, already from the European Agenda presented by Commissioner Johansson, Johansson uh, two clear, uh, two special issues were uh, highlighted. The, the first is prisons. And the other is uh, the stigma, uh, especially on the women uh, using drugs. And I think those are, uh, those, those are challenges that are as old and even older than EMCDDA. Uh, we, we modestly try to contribute. We, we need and we want to do more, but certainly to have such an emphasis uh, presented by, the, by the, the, the strategy, the action plan and the European agenda. 
are very important because now uh, the priority will be put for all the EU member states for the implementation of the action plan. And we at, this, at the MCDDA will contribute in terms not only of monitoring, but providing better services to practitioners and decision makers. The, 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 the work in prisons and in the, in the penal system and, and the high number of participants today illustrates that is, a, is very challenging work. And I would like to pay tribute to all the professionals working in that area. I had the privilege to be invited one week ago uh, uh, virtually uh, to Sevilla for the, for the uh, seminar organized by UNAS in Spain on the on treatment of addictions in the uh, penal process. There are so many courageous people who are trying to, to provide the best possible service. And, uh, and I, I, I think that their working conditions are sometimes becoming even more challenging than before. So we, we really need to pay attention to that. And, and why is it so important, but also why is it maybe so complex? Um, I think that uh, what uh, some people may forget is that uh, uh, basically when we speak ad, about prisons and drugs, it's a, it's a much broader issue than just drugs and drug use. Uh, I think it has to do with the, what is the society vision, what is the role of the prison and the penal system in our vision of society, in our vision of the human beings and in the project that we have for society. And here compared with other countries or regions in the world, uh, we have the chains that uh, we have the European values as they are stated uh, in the Lisbon Treaty uh, with the fundamental rights that, uh, that are explicitly applying to all citizens in the EU, including those who are using drugs. And uh, whether is it enough or not, probably not, we need to implement. Uh, but certainly uh, we have a set of core values in Europe uh, that, that are the, the ultimate reference uh, for all of us without discrimination or hopefully without discrimination. So the challenge for us, I think, is uh, based on the knowledge, on the, 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 the ideas you are going to discuss today, uh, to see how in the coming months, in the coming years, uh, we can, thanks to the information, thanks to the evidence, but also to your own experience, how can we raise the awareness that uh, uh, we should stop so maybe looking too specifically to some small parts of small policies and, and to go back to what's it one of the strengths and good results of be, building a European Union for so many years, which is, which is uh, uh, contributing to a space of freedom, justice and security. Uh, but we, we should uh, don't forget that citizenship is a much broader project for all the society. And uh, I think with all the risks uh, and all the crises that we have seen around us, uh, there may be a risk or potential risk to forget that this is our ultimate goal. And this is what makes our society a living democracy. We need to protect it and we need to see how we can contribute. So this webinar, I think, is a, a first new contribution from EMCDDA. I need to apologize. I, I used to stay and to share reflections at the end of the meeting. This is why today I've been a bit longer in my introduction. But today, it's a great day for me. Uh, I'm going to get my second vaccination in half an hour. And uh, I love you very much, but I don't want to sacrifice another 16 months of my life uh, because I don't go to the vaccination. So I will go to the vaccination and I, I will be informed by Marika, Linda and the colleagues about the possible follow-up. And I thank all those at the MCDDA, uh, Marika, the other colleagues who have taken the challenge uh, to organize the webinars, to invent them at the MCDDA, because we have uh, every time fantastic events and you make the difference. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you also for the good example with the vaccination. Of course, the webinars were your idea, <laughs> we just followed. <laughs> but uh, I want to waste more minutes uh, just to say Linda will chair the, the, the webinar and she will also give an introduction. Towards the end of the webinar, you will be able to ask questions in the questions and answer uh, button. So use it, already someone has started using them. So 
I, I will shut my camera and leave the floor to Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marika, and thank you, Alexis, for this introduction. Uh, I'm gl very glad to be here to introduce the uh, webinar and to chair this webinar on prison and drugs. Uh, the webinar, we will, I will present you some selected findings from the inside, and then we will discuss with uh, uh, important experts on the prison and drugs, the findings around some of the key questions. I will share now my screen. So to the title of uh, today's webinar is the title of the Insight publication that was published on the 26th of June. And I would like to acknowledge the EMCDDA project group. So my colleagues, Luis Royela, Ines Hasselberg, and Elizabeth Van Damme, who worked me in this insight. But as Alexis was saying, also several other uh, colleagues at the EMCDDA and external experts contributed in several and important way uh, to, to the insight. The insight has eight chapter, introductory chapter, setting the scene on prison and drugs in Europe two chapters on the epidemiology of uh, drug use before, during, and after incarceration, and one on drug-related health problems among people in prison with drug problems. Uh, the fourth and fifth chapter map and describe the available intervention for drug-related problems in the prison population, including harm reduction interventions. Then a sixth chapter discussed the evidence available for the implementation of those interventions, and seventh uh, describes the drug supply and supply reduction in prison, and finally the concluding chapter where we present the main issues, the challenges, and implication for policy and practice. The uh, report uh, is referring to 2019 in terms of year and concern 30 reporting countries, so 27 European member states, Norway, Turkey, and United Kingdom. Just to uh, give you some contextual information, on the 31st of January 2019, there were 856,000 people in prison in the 30 reporting countries, with the prison population rate of 142 people per 100,000 inhabitants, which is lower than the prison population rate reported in Russia and much lower than the, those that reported in the United States. However, there are also variations uh, across the European countries with the prison population rate of 50 reported in Finland and 330 in Turkey. Uh, another, it's important also to, uh, know, to have the characteristic of this population and to know that the large proportion of the prison population have sentences of five years or less and the recidivist rate is high. How drugs and prison are interconnected? They are uh, closely interconnected, and it's possible to identify three groups of people, those that are in prison for drug law offenses, including use, possession, and trafficking. Not all of them necessarily are drug users. In Europe, in the last uh, available data, 18% of the prison population are in prison for drug law offenses. Then there are people who are in prison for crime committed to support the drug use. And finally, people with drug-related problems or using drugs who are in prison for different type of crime. So as you can see, there is a, a close link between the two issues. And in this graph, you have uh, the data on the prevalence of drug use before imprisonment in 15 reporting countries. And as you can see, the level of prevalence is high for all substances and for all countries, although there are variations between countries. This variation depends on several factors, including differences in the prevalence in the community, in prison, differences in the drug legislation, in the enforcement of the drug legislation, but also difference, differences in the methodology which the data are collected. This is one of the reasons why we have uh, uh, defined with the group of experts around Europe that I would like to acknowledge and thanks uh, a European model questionnaire to collect comparable data across the country. In this graph, just shortly, you have this in six reporting country using similar, the same questionnaire, the comparison between the lifetime prevalence 
in among the prison population before imprisonment and in the community. And as you can see, the dots are all on the left part of the square, indicating an excess of drug use in this population. The excess is the highest for uh, cocaine and lowest for cannabis and is higher for women. So, but if many people in prison, a large proportion have experience with drugs, Many people, when they enter prison, they stop using drugs, but some continue to use, some uh, change their drug use patterns in terms of substances or route of administration, and some also start using drugs. Uh, an emerging phenomenon in the last years is the uh, appearance of new psychotic substances, particularly synthetic cannabinoids in prison, reported in several European countries. So drugs enter prison, and the main trafficking routes are the similar to the routes uh, used for other goods. So external visit, people movement, but also increasingly uh, the use of new technology like drones. Um, these, many of these uh, routes were uh, disrupted during the COVID pandemic because of the introduction of containment measures. And some have been used uh, more, than, more often than others, like the drones. Uh, the people in prison with drug problems have also uh, poorer uh, health, mental and physical health, and uh, uh, report high prevalence of several types of diseases. Here is just one of the information included in the insight on the high prevalence of drug-related infectious diseases in the total prison population. And the reason for this high uh, prevalence is also because a large proportion of those people are injecting or had experience with the drug injection, and also the high prevalence of psychiatric comorbidity. Mental health disorder, particularly due to the COVID pandemic, uh, were increasing in the community, in, among the people in, who use drugs, and among the prison population. So then the mortality, Alexis was mentioning before, the risk of mortality after prison release, but in general, the prison population report high mortality rate with suicide inside prison being the leading cause of deaths. But then there is a specific drug risk uh, when people leave prison. So the, uh, there is a very high risk of uh, overdose deaths in the first period after prison release, particularly in the first two weeks. And women report a particularly high risk more than men. Women are a small group in the prison population, represent 5% of the European prison population with variation between country. There is a higher proportion of women in prison for drug law offenses. Uh, and also the impact of imprisonment on women is more damaging, is uh, very severe because uh, their condition for instance, in prison, usually they are more isolated. They are uh, the primary care of children who are often then put in institution or foster care when they are imprisoned. And it's more difficult for them to be socially reintegrated when they leave prison because of several factors, including the fact that they are reporting double st stigma as ex-offenders, triple uh, extra users, but also they are, don't fulfill the social expectation for their gender role. So what is done in prison, we have in the inside, we try to describe the different type of existing intervention according to the phase of the imprisonment from prison entry, health assessment, detoxification, in prison stay, there are pharmacological intervention, psychosocial intervention, and harm reduction intervention, and in prison release, where there are several harm reduction interventions to reduce the risk of overdose, but also important intervention in terms of social reintegration and linkage to health and social care. The, uh, most of these interventions have an evidence 
in the community, but the evidence in prison is scarce. It's scarce because there is little research that's been conducted. Although there are some interventions that have been proven to be effective and are used uh, in prison like OST or the, in, the uh, intervention for infectious diseases. On the right, you have the publication, the important publication that was based on uh, scientific evidence and also the opinion of uh, experts in the field. Here, uh, uh, in one of the chapter, I say we map the interventions that are officially available in the different European countries. And this is just the number of countries where those interventions are available. As you can see, we go from intervention on infectious diseases and information that are available in all countries, OST continued from the community is available in 29 out of 30 countries. Uh, but there are some interventions that are widely available in community that are available only in few countries in, in, in prison, like needle and syringe programs or take home naloxone. What we have seen is that with the scarce data we have, there is low coverage of this intervention and also the intervention were introduced much later in prison than in the community. Here is an example of OST where you can see that the first Opioid substitution treatment were introduced in Sweden in 65 and the, the first in, in prison in 85, 20 years later. To conclude, some key issues that I think it imp is important to highlight. So prison is uh, uh, a place where the population is, there is a large proportion of, of social vulnerable population. So they may require not only the, the implementation of the principle of equivalence of care, but the equity of care. So in, additional intervention to reach the equivalence. Prison and community are not separated. There are two uh, words that are in continuous connection where the continuity of care then is really important to ensure with coordination across different services. Prison are always places where the professional uh, leave this tension between two objectives, the care and control, and this should be addressed in some country and approach of whole of government responsibility has been adopted. As I said before, there are key interventions proven to be effective in the community that are working in prison, that they should be implemented and scaled up in prison. In the insight, in the report, we don't talk about alternatives approach because it's focusing on the situation inside prison, but it's important uh, to assess and to balance the cost and benefits for the prison. Uh, population, a prison system. A recent Norwegian research tried to model what would be the reduction of uh, uh, a pre imprisonment episode if you uh, uh, abolish the drug law offenses, that it will be 18% with all uh, drug-related crimes, it would be 60% reduction in the prison episode. Finally, and this is really important for the MCDDA and all the agency working on data collection and monitoring, I think it's necessary really to improve the, uh, the to increase uh, the information available and improve the evidence, the research and monitoring on drugs in prison. But you will find more information and more detailed information in the prison and drugs insight. And uh, uh, I think it would be nice now to go and move on to the discussion. Thank you to all for listening. So today we have uh, four guest speakers uh, with us. Blanca Shulak. Blanca is the head of drug treatment department. Uh, in uh, the prison hospital in Zagreb. Uh, Blanca is a social pedagogue and she has large experience in the field of prevention and treatment of substance abuse among offenders and contributed to development and implementation of rehabilitation programs. Heino Stover is a well-known international prison and drugs expert, uh, is a professor of social scientific addiction research at the Frankfurt University of Applied Science in Germany. And he has been working for many years since the 80s in the field of addiction, particularly in the pro health promotion for vulnerable and marginalized groups, including uh, people in prison, is consultant for several international organizations. 
Mark Johnson is the founder of User Voices. User Voices is a UK NGO aiming to foster the dialogue between service users, service providers, uh, and aid rehabilitation and recovery of people with prison experience. Mark is an expert from his own personal experience, and his story is documented in his best-selling autobiography, Wasted. He is also consulted for governments and charities. Finally, last but not least, Teano Mavru Mastaki. He is the head of the Department of Civil Litigation of the Law Office of the Republic of Cyprus. She is a senior legal counselor for the government at Attorney General's office in the country. She's also legal advisor for the National Cyprus Authority Against Addiction, and she is nominated the legal ed correspondent expert for the MCDDA since 2002. So thank you to all the speakers for participating, and uh, uh, we will organize the discussion around a few questions. The first one is why it's important to address the issue of drugs and prison for policymakers, practitioners, and people with lived experience. I would like to ask Heino to start commenting on this question and I will stop sharing my screen. Many thanks, Linda, for the introduction and for your presentation of the new Insight uh, Prison and Drugs. So I think it's, it's very important uh, for the groups you mentioned, policymakers, uh, practitioners, um, to address the problem of drugs in prison because uh, prisoners uh, come from the community and they return to it. And so uh, prison health is always public health. So uh, we are um, highly uh, looking on the, the treatment uh, during imprisonment, uh, which is very important. Um, we do have revolving door effects among prisoners. Many of the prisoners uh, incarcerated are there for several times, have been there for several times already. And um, so far, we especially look at people who are using drugs before, during and after imprisonment. And um, it's very important uh, that we look for a continuous care and counseling for those people who were um, put to prison because they are taking drugs or they were financing drugs or, or they were smuggling or producing drugs um, because it is a highly marginalized and vulnerable group. Um, which needs uh, a lot of treatment. You mentioned already in your uh, graphs, uh, the hepatitis C and uh, HIV um, prevalence uh, in prisons that indicates that uh, the people in prison are manifold higher infected uh, than in the community. And we should um, take um, a special um, eye on, on, on this group. <clears throat> um, so imprisonment is associated with increased levels uh, of health risks including overdose and infectious diseases transmission. You mentioned that already. And uh, it does not only affect people in the prison, but also prison after, uh, people afterwards uh, in the community. Um, let me shortly mention the EU drug strategy, which has been mentioned by Alexis already. Um, I think in this uh, drug strategy, uh, the spirit of this insight has gone in already because uh, um, they identified their four priority areas um, to be uh, in this strategy. One is to assure equivalence and continuity of healthcare provision in prison and by probationary services. The second is uh, <clears throat> uh, to implement um, interventions that are evidence-based measures to prevent and reduce drug use and its health consequences, including measures to address the risk of drug-related deaths and the transmission of blood-borne viruses. Third is to provide overdose prevention and referral services to ensure continuity of care um, on release. And fourth is the availability of drugs in prison should be restricted. So I think in these four priority areas, uh, this, the, the spirit of this um, insight has already gone in. Um, and in so far, I think it delivers um, a very good and solid database for all policymakers, for all stakeholders and decision makers in order to plan national um, strategies uh, which are focusing on the group of uh, drug users in prison. Thank you, Anna. Thank you also for highlighting this link with the community, the continuity of care, which was a big issue also during the pandemic and uh, reporting on the importance of uh, using this information for 
policymaker. As you mentioned, the intervention and the treatment, I would like to give the floor to Blanca Shulak um, to try to provide from the perspective of a health professional in prison, uh, her view on this first question on why it's important to address this issue. Blanca, please. Thank you, Linda, and thank you also uh, for the introduction part. Uh, well, I can uh, only firmly uh, agree with Heino in several points. Uh, the statement that prison health, the health of the prisoners, is uh, also an issue of public health is uh, more than more than true and that uh, that is a fact this uh, covid situation that has happened uh, around the world uh, did prove us, prove us that because uh, what we did inside with our prisoners during the pandemic situation uh, reflected uh, to the outside world so uh, all our intervention in uh, prisons and penitentiaries uh, were aimed to contain the COVID uh, spreading and to um, to keep the prisoners safe. So uh, that uh, that situation that we I think the most uh, prisons in uh, European countries handled that well. Uh, it was the, uh, the the living proof that prisoners inside and the uh, all actions and uh, all uh, treatment, uh, rehabilitation programs, and uh, everything that we do with prisoners inside uh, has a big impact on uh, the uh, civil society uh, that welcomes that uh, uh, prisoner outside. Uh, so what I wanted also to say that uh, there has been an increasement of pharmacological therapy inside prison, inside prison uh, administration because uh, due to the COVID uh, situation, we had uh, restrained uh, visits from the outside and that has, uh, that has an impact on our prisoners' organization of life inside. Uh, so that was something that was also a new dimension for us because uh, we do not have that much problem in Croatia uh, with drugs inside prisons. We do have a larger issue with, um, with the uh, opioid substitute therapy because uh, that's what usually happens when, we, uh, we, when an addict uh, enters the prison system. Uh, the usual benefit of uh, opioid substitute therapy seems to uh, lose some sense because of this increasement uh, that happened due to the, to the pandemic situation. Uh, what has proven to be a good uh, recipe for a very successful uh, treatment for addicts in prison administration is a combination of pharmaceutical approach and a combination of CBT approach programs, cognitive behavior programs in working with, uh, with addicts. Uh, so that uh, is also one of the recommendations of the European uh, uh, Council of, uh, uh, of the European uh, 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 boards that uh, in, are involved in giving some uh, good references and uh, guidelines to the prison administration upon this uh, treatment of uh, prisoners in uh, inside and after release. We had a good cooperation with our probation system and it is, uh, so to speak, they are uh, our prolonged uh, uh, friends outside who work with us in, the, in, uh, in this continuity of treatment. But what also was shown to be effective is the uh, NGOs. Uh, probation system sometimes is uh, overloaded uh, with uh, lots of uh, alternative sanctions that they have to um, continue. And uh, what has been a good uh, third part in our process 
of how to maintain the continuance of the treatment that was started in uh, prison administration. Uh, the third part seems to be in several NGOs who uh, have uh, approached us with, uh, with uh, good programs, which uh, we often uh, start within our prisoners while they're inside, and then the treatment continues while they go outside. The question of why mm -hmm. it's important uh, for policymakers to uh, be addressed of this issue because of uh, a common situation when the uh, legislative is being made or developed about how to handle this problem in prison situation, there are not, uh, not a lot of um, practical uh, uh, experts from the prison administration who are uh, directly involved in this uh, in, in this uh, treatment. So uh, usually we have laws and bylaws that uh, which predict a large amount of this and that, but uh, not of the, many of those things are not so practically useful for us. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much, Blanca. And you give me the opportunity to give the floor to Teano Mavrumostaki, as you mentioned, the policymaker and how the policymaker can uh, support the implementation of important interventions in prison. Please, Teano. Hello to everybody. Thank you, Linda. Well, I think uh, we all understand and we agree that uh, prison and communi uh, community, as you said, cannot be separated. So this is why it is so important to address this issue and realize that population in prison yesterday's and tomorrow's is uh, the same population of the community. Plus, there are special problems that can develop in prisons. In, in that environment, of course, we all understand that things can get worse, but, but, Control can also be facilitated because they are in a controlled they are in a controlled environment. I found very interesting uh, reading your um, the publication that uh, in prisons there are people that have access to therapy for the first time, but there are also people who have access to drugs for the first time. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, these uh, opportunities of to work with these people and they are in a controlled environment. So maybe access to them, to their therapy or education is easier. Um, there is a need to address these issues, of course, because uh, people need to get ready mm -hmm. to be prepared for uh, their early release, if, uh, for their release. And, um, we did have a problem with early releases recently in Cyprus, as I mentioned to you earlier, that uh, when uh, in COVID times, people were uh, released earlier, uh, not prepared. There was no such chance uh, for um, their continuation of their therapy. And there, was, there were some problems there. However, there was a strange finding that crime rates were uh, reduced. Of course, we had a strict lockdown then, so maybe criminologists need to look at this and not uh, it's not for this uh, uh, webinar to discuss. So people need to be ready to reintegrate. There are health issues, criminal justice issues, uh, social issues. So uh, this is why it is important to address, address this issue when people are in the controlled environment. There are also civil justice issues. I mean, civil law. Uh, uh, civil lawyer. So I know that from that side, we very often need to defend the government in uh, uh, cases uh, involving uh, prison. So there are civil justice issues as well. Um, now, uh, the understanding needs, needs to be that people uh, need to be ready to be released. The understanding is that drugs circulate in prisons, and this is a great, uh, you know, an understanding for everybody. If we, and that would be, should be a priority to control this circulation. If we cannot mm -hmm. control it completely, and then I'm sure in every prison there are efforts done in that. 
respect, then facing and regulating uh, these issues uh, must be a priority for everybody. Uh, so good understanding is needed. Okay. Uh, with a, of the population you are dealing with and uh, prioritizing the issues to face when entering, during, and after release. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes. and you also make the nice bridge talking about the population. And I would like now to give the floor to Mark Johnson and to have the perspective, user perspective. Uh, on these uh, right. questions on how is important uh, to address the drugs in prison issue. Mark. Yeah, hi there. Thank, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, why, why it's important to address uh, drugs in prison is really like kind of um, the saddest and sort of the end of the, a very sad situation for a lot of lives of uh, um, drug users. Um, it shows a failure from societal systems from uh, um, prevention in childhood and addressing early childhood trauma to all of society's um, um, constructs to address like uh, human health. It shows a failure in uh, how police are the default mental health service uh, in our society, how the courts have a skills deficit into not uh, criminalising um, and, and being able to filter and assess um, criminogenic factors to drug use to um, sort of uh, social biological uh, factors. Uh, it shows a skills deficit within the probation services um, in the community and uh, ultimately people end up in prison, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so and, and this, this issue um, is basically down to policymakers, and I'm going to make quite a challenging statement, policymakers and practitioners do not understand the living reality of somebody that is literally drug addicted and in prison. And, um, you know, that's pretty much why I started uh, the organisation, which I founded, uh, and I was in the privileged position to be able to do that and speak quite loudly. Um, Alexi uh, started by saying, uh, we've got the science, you know, there's a historical sort of record of the of lots of science around drugs misuse and um, and prison. Yeah, we still have an absolute systemic failure to address it. And, um, and all of this science equates to kind of nothing if it doesn't change somebody that's in prison's life so they don't reoffend. And we as a society need to really look at how we get successful reintegration of of those people. And that's why I centered all of my efforts and work on peer-led approach, which some would say discredit through antidotal or unscientific or not research, but actually what we've found over 16 years is it makes the difference on the ground because we're talking now at this conference that's EU-wide and I'll guarantee you, we could go into any prison in any country that's here and speak to a group of people which would corroborate the most basic sort of narrative of, of what we're talking about. Um, we, it, so, so yeah, so going into that, so um, we work in sort of uh, one fifth of prison. Uh, the COVID situation I'm, I'm talking about now, so 2020, we engaged 23,000 people uh, in, in prison in the community. We were the, the last ones out and the first ones back in. 83% um, felt more isolated, 87 more frustrated, 80% more stressed, 65 worried. This worrying factor is less than a third has uh, been seen by a mental health team. So we've had 17 months of 23 and a half hour um, bang up. And I'll say 23 and a half hour because statutory is 23. But if you go to a healthcare, and I'm talking primary healthcare in a British prison, they take half an hour off your um, uh, time out yourself. So it's 23 hours over seven months. Um, British prisons have just moved to stage three, which means uh, one visit a month by um, a, an immediate family. We know that prisoners don't have, predominantly don't have families or have broken relationships. So if you don't have immediate family, you don't have any visits. Um, and I'm just started to lead on a research project, which is the economic social Research Council funded with uh, Professor Shad Maruna from Queen's Belfast into a study uh, uh, impact of COVID by prisoners. So we're, we're um, training as peer researchers about 60 
uh, prisoners and uh, will be conducting the work over the last 12 months and I'm happy to report back again. Thank you, thank you, Mark. We have only 10 minutes left, so maybe I suggest we go through some questions already. Uh, so there was one question regarding uh, uh, the treatment. So uh, in prison, you say we normally give methadone or buprenorphine for the opioid drug addicts. So what should we do with other substances users like methamphetamine, cocaine or cannabis user? I don't know if uh, uh, Heino or Blanca want to reply. Please, Blanca, short reply so we can manage. I mean, the... what we can do is... Yeah. Uh... Please, well, what we should do is um, to offer pharmacological uh, services. And we're in the lucky position that for opioid use disorder, we do have uh, <clears throat> medication assisted treatment with either methadone um, or buprenorphine or even uh, diacetylmorphine or slow release morphine, whatever. Uh, we've got some options for that. And for the other, um, uh, let's say addiction phenomena, uh, we do not have, we are not in the lucky position to have uh, uh, pharmacological um, responses. But what we do have, and what has been mentioned already by Blanca, is we've got uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, plus uh, we've got self help groups uh, um, that could work and function in the same way as groups and uh, as strategies outside. So uh, the best thing would be to integrate uh, NGOs, um, external uh, people from outside, in order, uh, let's say, to benefit from the trust they're giving uh, and uh, let's say to install such groups and such uh, self-help activities inside prison. Thank you, Aino. I want to just, since you talk about trust, uh, to give back the floor to Mark regarding this. So what, what is, the, how is important is this, the trust inside prison to implement uh, else or social intervention? Can you, can you repeat that again? Sorry. Yeah, Linda. yeah. My Heino was talking about the trust, the needs uh, for the trust. Uh, and I think this is a key, uh, probably, factors uh, for the implementation of good intervention in Cyprus. Yes, I mean, it, I, I find it really hard to comment on uh, prison 18 months ago and using that as a reference because COVID has literally been a game changer, right? So there is no trust. So Heine talked about uh, pharmaceutical intervention. I'll tell you the, the number one, uh, which is what we're finding, I've only just done the first bits of uh, the group work, um, is uh, the use of uh, antidepressant medication. So the, the prisoner state saying that prisons are stable and there's a drop in number of users and users are reporting that 60% uh, they didn't use within the first five months of lockdown, which is very convenient running a prison regime. Um, but what we're going to, I think the merging trend will be, is the, the, the sort of blase prescriptions on um, anti, you know, antidepressant medication. And that's how we're dealing with this. The, the fact is in British prison, like 17 months, there's been no intervention. So you've had, and, and, and actually more worrying, the reporting structures from individuals to healthcare or prison regimes <laughs> I, I believe we're going to have a emerging trend of under-reporting what the actual truth is by, by prisoners yeah. because the mechanisms have gone because outside agencies, including inspectorate bodies, et cetera, have actually been withdrawn from there. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a tricky one, but uh, I think trust is at all time lows for uh, prisoners in the state, you know, uh, being to sell, you know, over that period of time. Um, some of the harrowing stories. I, I, I've been doing this a, a while, listening to people and consulting, and I, I actually cried in the last group that I heard of, with a group of women talking about their experiences. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. So I give the floor to Blanca. Maybe she wants to comment on this intervention for uh, other type of drugs. Uh, well, and maybe are... also the, the reference to the COVID situation, as I see, there was also some question regarding this. Uh, there are several combinations, uh, uh, not only the, uh, for, for the substitution therapy, Mark has uh, mentioned the antidepressants, so they are adequate responses from our psychiatrist to uh, the individual need of each and every uh, prisoner according to, uh, to the uh, uh, 
uh, his uh, opioid uh, or perhaps cocaine. Uh, uh, the the <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, amphetamines. Yes, addiction. Yeah. Addiction. addiction. Uh, okay. So in my experience, the, the opioid substitute therapy is never only one pharmacological uh, choice. There are all, uh, always several which are targeting uh, several prisoners' needs. So this, they are not uh, the only two uh, choices in the treatment of. Uh, drug addicts in a prison setting, methadone or buprenorphine. Although the buprenorphine is also state, uh, it is also described as a moderator of the um, level uh, of the mood. So it has other uh, um, impacts on the mental health of the prisoner, not just the one which are restricting him uh, for uh, using the drug. I didn't, I'm not sure did I uh, heard Mark well about the situation in prison that because of the COVID situation, we uh, were not allowed to be supervised in our work. Did, did I heard you that you said that? Because we did have some restrictions in prison situation, in prison, administration because of the COVID, but uh, it didn't stop the regular supervisor, supervisors from a uh, minister of health, uh, especially from them during this COVID situation. Uh, they have, we had several uh, unannounced visits uh, because uh, they wanted to make sure do we uh, the, are we handling the situation with this epidemic okay? And we got lots of assistance during this uh, period of time because uh, what happened outside uh, to the rest of the world happened to each and every prison in penitentiary in the country. So we needed an extra uh, help and we did get it. And we did get a lot of um uh, other uh, supervised um, uh, visits because it is mandatory to uh, take care of, uh, especially in the demand custody trials. Uh, so that didn't vanish, but it, uh, prisoners uh, had a chance not to physically have contact with the judges. Uh, they had opportunity to be heard through this uh, video link conference like we do have now. So uh, we also managed to, uh, uh, to, um, to make our communication and to make it possible for prisoners to communicate to the outside of the world through internet connection. Uh, okay. Th th thank you, Blanca. See, uh, I know, please, you yeah. wanted to comment. I just wanted to, to add um, to what uh, Mark and uh, Blanca said, that uh, also, let's say, not only drug-specific activities and interventions are necessary, but also, let's say, indirect uh, measures and activities are, are uh, necessary, like a meaningful work and occupation, sports activities, and so on. All these measures uh, um, are uh, necessary in terms of mobilizing people and uh, showing them, let's say, um, physical um, um, achievements uh, they can, uh, or physical um, yeah, achievements they can go for. That's something I think which needs also be mentioned. Thank you, thank you, Aino. Uh, so that, I think this round also completed, I, I answered a bit the second question on, uh, um, uh, what are the effective and social responses that can address the drug problem? I don't know if uh, Tiano wants to add something regarding this question. Then there are several questions in the chat and I will comment just after Tiano's. Thank you, Linda. Uh, yes, I will mention something different to what my colleagues uh, mentioned. And, uh, uh, there has to be a realization there is an interconnection between drugs and prison. Uh, plus, poor health in many inmates, as we noticed. Uh, from my respect, 
uh, it is important. It is important to protect the human rights, firstly, of uh, people in prison, including the right to highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Whatever that means in uh, practice, it, uh, they have a human right to have uh, access to uh, highest standards under the circumstances of uh, health of, of uh, health and treatment. Um, so the, I think that they should all uh, we should all work uh, having three, uh, steps in our mind, and first is to identify the nature of the drug problems of each uh, person involved, uh, select potentially effective interventions specified for each one of them, and be able to evaluate and uh, with these interventions. So, of course, there will be improvement if possible. Um, Thank you. So, has to have to be maintained and there has to be a, continu a continuation uh, after, after they are released to avoid the other problems uh, uh, discussed before. Uh, as uh, Alexis mentioned, and that was, uh, I will not say scary, but it was uh, something that uh, we need to uh, take into account again and again is that 30 years ago they were discussing uh, deaths after release and we are still discussing it now. So this maybe makes it very, very important again to uh, prioritize the problems, the health problems in prison and face them. Thank you. Thank you, Teano, for this. Uh, I profit to uh, answer uh, Two, two questions regarding recent studies. We have conducted a, a, a rapid assessment on the impact of COVID on drugs in prison, uh, on drugs in the drug issue in the community and in prison. So you will find in, the, in our EMCDD website uh, um, this, uh, the result of the study uh, showing that there was, as I say in the presentation, a reduction in drug use, disruption of the dormant tra drug trafficking route, but also for the services, this implied a lot of uh, reduction uh, of all the collective activities, and that was a problematic for the people uh, who are in prison. There was an increase as Mark and uh, what they were saying of the mental health problems with uh, higher requests of use of, of benzodiazepine inside the prison. A specific issue I think Elena Leclerc asked was is the impact of the measure of early release. Uh, I don't think there is any assessment that was conducted yet, but uh, uh, we had a session in a recent expert meeting on this, uh, what could, could have been the impact of the measures of uh, reduction of the prison population on drugs and if the countries have adopted. I don't know if Teano again, as you were in this meeting, you want to comment on this specific issue and then we'll go back to other question on uh, interventions. Well, as uh, you want me, uh, well, what happened in my country, there were yes. early releases. Uh, there were criteria, of course, for on whoever was released. The problem that I mentioned also earlier was that because of course, there had to be releases, uh, but uh, people were not prepared to continue their treatment. And maybe under the strict lockdown we had and all this strange situation, it was a first time in a few, in many, many years situation. Uh, there was no access to continue therapy. So uh, yes, there were some problems in, psych in psychiatric hospitals. Maybe people needed help in elsewhere. As I said before, what I found interesting was that crime, drug crime, drug uh, offenses were greatly reduced as the police gave, them number, uh, gave uh, the numbers to me. But this is a different area. Uh, so one has to balance COVID in a closed environment, prison, and uh, continuation of treatment. 
I'm not sure I can give you the answer yet because we don't, it's very early, I believe, to know exactly what is going on and what, uh, how things will um, be in the future. But this is something we noticed that we had the the, these problems in psychiatric hospitals. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Teano. Going back to the intervention, to uh, there is one question uh, that uh, on uh, that's probably for Blanca or others. How do you promote motivation to drug treatment to within prison? Uh, I don't know if who want to reply to this question. I see Mark smiling. Um. You, you basically create recovery communities within prison and um, seeing is believing, yeah? So prisoners play an absolutely instrumental part in promoting motivation for other prisoners who are newly arrived to access the relevant treatment. And actually more importantly, to, uh, to uh, as a route out of it, of abstinence, you know, and uh, there is a kind of a historic sort of, uh, evidence around recovery communities and uh, therapeutic communities within within prisons across Europe, I believe, as well, so. Thank you, Mark. Blanca, do you want to add? Uh, uh, I have mentioned before that we uh, have very good results in working in rehabilitation programs with drug addicts uh, based on the cognitive behavior model. One of, uh, one of the most common technique is called the motivational interview. Uh, so, in prison personnel, prison and probation officers had to go through the education. It lasts for two days. It's a training, and it is a very good method for people uh, to be triaged uh, before involvement in, of the rehabilitation process. So, the motivation is the key word, the key, the, the, the base of all, and it's uh, something that we uh, have to do with our prisoners during the whole uh, uh, staying in, and during the whole sentence. It's not something that we just touch at the beginning of the imprisonment and then leave it there. We have to nourish motivation of the prisoners. We have, we have amplitudes, we are going down, we are going uh, up. Uh, so it's, it is a, a process that starts by entering inside and hopefully uh, ends uh, with a good solid motivation uh, to take care and to, uh, to be involved in this continuous of the process that we already uh, have mentioned here several times. It is the, uh, I think the only, uh, uh, the only positive effect is to, to be continued, to be inside the prison in some kind of treatment and after release. Uh, one without the other doesn't, doesn't work. Thanks. Thanks, Blanca. I see Heino, you want to, to comment, maybe linking also to his experience on harm reduction intervention. Uh, I know you're muted. Um, I think what is motivating is uh, that people can make uh, choices, that they have options uh, they can take. If there's only a one-size-fits-all strategy, then I think uh, it is not very motivating. So I think we have to have a compendium, uh, a comprehensive package of uh, services in place, uh, the same as outside in the community, in order that people can make informed uh, decisions and informed choices. So I think this is the baseline for motivation. Thank you, thank you, Heino. And uh, there were several questions on the uh, pra best practice or evidence uh, of effectiveness. As I say in the presentation, there is evidence for uh, the community intervention, less for prison because there is less research, uh, less information inside uh, the prison. In the report, we report uh, we discussed the evidence, but also in the uh, chapter where we map the intervention, we report several examples from country. They are not best practices, but they are examples. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, I know you can comment in particular on the evidence uh, and the effectiveness of harm reduction intervention in prison. Yeah. 
So we just uh, carried out an overview uh, of, uh, let's say, the state of harm reduction in, in the thir in 30 European countries, uh, 28 plus Norway and Turkey. Um, and what we found out with regards to harm reduction oriented interventions was that the availability and the coverage of harm reduction interventions in European prisons was limited compared to the community and the, the, there is a gap between international recommendations on paper and on paper availability of interventions and the actual implementation. So we've concluded that scaling up harm reduction in prison and uh, through care can, can achieve important individual and public health benefits. I put the link to the uh, survey into the chat so each and everybody can uh, enter it. And I think that is uh, very important. You mentioned that already, Linda, that most of the interventions are coming into prisons with some delay and with very limited coverage. Uh, just two examples. Um, Germany is put under the three countries who offer a needle exchange um, um, program, but this is only true in one, it's only implemented in one out of 181 prisons. So it's a, a coverage rate less than 0.5%. Uh, um, the second example is OST. Also, uh, let's say there are only few countries uh, who have uh, offered uh, OST like UK and France to a high extent. <clears throat> and many countries are below 50% coverage. Um, you are highlighting that in the report uh, very well. And even let's say um, you highlighted the case of Mr. Wenner against Germany, a case court before the European Court uh, for Human Rights um, there, a, a prisoner went finally to Strasbourg uh, um, before he failed two times on, uh, let's say, two levels of, of courts in Germany because his um, OST was interrupted on, on the day of incarceration. And that, of course, is a breach of the European uh, um, Convention of Human Rights. And Germany has been sanctioned uh, for that. Um, and uh, so we see that it is not only, let's say, a topic of, of money and uh, let's say resources, it's often a topic of uh, attitude uh, and morale, uh, which uh, hinders and hampers uh, the introduction and the implementation of harm reduction uh, interventions. Thank you, thank you, Heino. And as Heino was saying, it's, I think it's important also to remember that we uh, uh, have collected in the report, reported in the report, the officially available interventions. So for instance, needle and siderage exchange are available officially in uh, two countries extensively and in Germany, just in one prison, but there are uh, uh, single doctors that take the took the initiative to uh, uh, to do this intervention, and also opioid substitution treatment is as I say it's available now as a continuation from uh, the community, but not in uh, just in two thirds of the countries uh, is possible to start opioid substitution treatment in prison. And as I, I think it would be uh, it's important to highlight as what I know was saying that. The coverage is low, but also we don't have good information to establish the coverage. So that's another gap that we we, we should, uh, I think, fill. There are several other questions in the uh, in the chat um, uh, regarding. I don't know if uh, Mark or uh, Blanca can reply. There is one question on uh, the use. Uh, of uh, uh, prescribed medication in prison and what are the issues around misuse, mi, my, misuse and diversion. I don't know if you have any information on this. Blanca? As to my knowledge, uh, the prescription uh, medication uh, from the outside, I, I hope that this, yeah. that, that is the yeah. question, yes. It is available uh, inside the prison uh, but it can be changed to the other generic uh, uh, treatment because uh, it depends on uh, uh, of the provider for the pharmaceutical of the prison administration. So uh, the the treat the uh, uh, the cure itself has to be the same, uh, like from the outside world, but. If we do not have the same provider or the manufacturer, uh, it has to be the same line uh, of uh, the drug. 
So thanks, thanks, Blanca. Don't know if anyone want to add anything else on this. Um, uh, I would then move to the last question, so that we prepare. Uh, that is how the this report, EMCDDA report, can be useful in your work. So uh, let's start with Teano. Thank you, Linda. And thank you for uh, involving us in this uh, uh, webinar. And thank you for the publication, which I found very, very interesting. And uh, not only it can help all kinds of experts uh, dealing uh, in this area. Uh, me personally, I realized things I didn't know, and this is the most important thing for me. I got information, evidence-based information, and uh, I the realization, I think, is number one, is the basis to build on and continue and finding solutions uh, in complicated and difficult issues as dealing with uh, uh, dependence and uh, health issues in prisons. And uh, to me, it was very, very important. Plus, uh, we now know it was an easy way, easy way, not easy for you to draft it, but uh, we find the information easily, which country could be facing same issues as uh, we do. And, uh, you know, follow examples or give our examples to other countries. So. Really, I was uh, very, very, very impressed reading the publication. And uh, uh, the first thing I can say, the main thing is the realization of various issues uh, around drugs in prison. Drugs in prison, as we mentioned before, is correlated, unfortunately. So uh, to me, it was uh, very, very, very useful. And I'm sure uh, our experts, now that we have it and our uh, institutions will have a chance to study it and, uh, you know, maybe contact you for further um, help on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blanca, do you want to comment on C and also comment on how is it possible to reach better our uh, like audience and those who can make direct use of this information? Well, I, uh, as a practitioner, can say that uh, all the publications from the MCDDA that I, that I have been reading were very good and informative uh, for us because, as Tiano said, it gives them the oversight what is good, what is happening in the region, and perhaps somebody uh, did something better than we did. So the, um, the coping with this problem of the drug dependence in the prison administration is very complex, and it is uh, not the one-way ticket. Uh, so uh, the publications are for me, uh, very valuable because they are evidence based. So that is something that I also cherish. This document document has some uh, several main chapters which are really uh, helpful uh, because it targets uh, all the issues uh, that we are facing uh, while trying to improve uh, our exist existing model of uh, treatment of drug addicts in the prison setting. Uh, I uh, only can say that uh, thank you for publishing this. Thank you for the good work uh, that you have done. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, to have some colleagues of mine, which I uh, uh, gave them the link to the PDF so they can read and that we can comment because uh, I think that this particular uh, um, insight uh, is uh, very well done because of the data you have collected. Thank you, thank you, Blanca. Now I, uh, I give the floor to Mark to have his view on this, how this can be useful for your work. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, as you know, Linda, I'm, I'm a great supporter of your work and the, um, the report is really informative from uh, sort of data and sort of what the issues are. Um, 
I've read uh, the report concludes more studies are needed on the outcomes and interventions uh, targeting demand as well as supply reduction in prison settings. I think that uh, these are some of the things that we must think about going forward around looking at the criminal justice systems as a whole and how the regimes actually um, are in the systemic sort of the, the system of those regimes actually go to exacerbate um, drugs misuse in prison themselves and actually what some of the solutions are so I think it's um, it, it's crucial um, that we not we not only involve prisoners uh, and ex-prisoners but we actually start to look at how they can contribute like I have with you uh, their own research projects and services and actually go one step further and it's something we've been looking at around how you get, because often this problem, we can talk about the global issue of data, which is really, there's really rich here, but actually it's site specific or country specific and site specific that actually where, where it, it sort of um, uh, has, the, has the most impact. And, um, and prisoners play a crucial role in that site specific element. So if we had a mechanism um, that looked at things like procurement involving prisoners in site-specific environments about the procurement of healthcare services that they receive is one way that we could think global about this addressing this issue but act local as far as um, making services relevant to that community in that country within that right set and I think that we could perhaps uh, look at that as you know sort of one of the areas uh, sort of going forward but yeah thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And the last is uh, Aino. What is your view on this? Are you muted still? <laughs> um, so it's a very important document, uh, Linda, and thanks to all the authors and all those who contributed to that. It's important in that way that we will use it definitely as a reference point, as a source, when we argue with ministries of justice, interior or health, uh, in order to show them what can be done, what should be done. Um, it has uh, a fantastic data collection uh, on the point. Um, and this has really improved in the last 20 years. When I remember in 1999, I was doing some sort of the first version of uh, this coll of data collection in the field of prison and drugs. And then at that time, the, uh, the data um, basis was was very weak, but I think it uh, improved a lot. And uh, as I mentioned, as it has gone down now to the uh, European Drug Strategy 21-25. And, and so far, um, it's uh, a very good um, um, uh, book, a very good uh, document, uh, which uh, I think um, can show stakeholders and uh, key persons in the ministries what can be done uh, elsewhere in Europe. It's not, let's say, exotic in a way, but if I tell people that, uh, for instance, in Luxembourg, they have a professional tattooer coming into the prison in order to avoid infectious risks uh, when people are doing their tattoos in prison, uh, then uh, it is a very good reference document for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I know I continue with you because then there are some other questions. I think we have still seven minutes. And there is one question for you, uh, if you can tell, please, some example of good practices for social workers in the field of drug addiction prevention and treatment in prison, uh, based on your experience of training and so on. Yeah. You want me to repeat? No, no, no. Uh, I, 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 okay. So, so social work, um, I think, um, is being done uh, by a uh, prison-based social worker and by people coming from outside, inside prison. Uh, um, also within NGOs, there's a lot of social work coming in. Um, I think what can be done, what could be done from the social work perspective is uh, reintegration. All activities that uh, go in that direction can be pushed uh, by the social worker inside prison. That means uh, housing first, for instance, uh, occupation, contact to families, parents and, and, and uh, children even. Um, and also, let's say, um, working on the two key standards or the key principles, that is equivalence of care and continuity of care. Um, so fight for the introduction or the implementation of the same size, uh, standard and quality of services which are done 
offered outside, inside prison, and also to do everything as a social worker uh, to uh, guarantee uh, a continuity of care once people are released. And a very good example highlighted in the report or in the insight is the example of naloxone. So naloxone training a few days before release and giving out the kit so that let's say the first 48 hours out uh, can be survived in a way that uh, many people will have uh, naloxone to help themselves to give it out to the family or so um, in order of an overdose and in relapse that something can be done. Thank you, thank you, Aino. And uh, regarding the contact of uh, drug users uh, or uh, people in prison with uh, their family, there is a question, maybe Mark wants to reply to this. So it's, uh, how uh, is it possible to improve the contact with family during incarceration, as this may be an important factor for rehab rehabilitation? Uh, uh, yes, is a, <laughs> yes, a simple answer. Um, in, in the UK, they call it, I think Blanca mentioned it as well, around video contact and stuff, you know, during COVID. Um, we, however, we run a risk of overusing that method. And so for the regime, prison regimes, it's actually quite convenient that we provide screen and actually not have human contact. So um, they call it purple visits in the UK and they've been very much welcomed, you know what I mean? Like, uh, especially during the last 18 months. However, um, I'll give you a situation. Um, uh, met a, a young girl, 21. Um, she's been uh, literally COVID locked, bang up for uh, 17 months. She's got a three-year-old baby. Um, the, she's just had a visit last week when I met, when she told me the story and she had a visit four metres apart and had to wear a bin liner to have contact with her daughter and her daughter called her auntie. Okay. So, and she'd been having these visits with a young child running around a house, but no contact. So a video screen is limiting, but very convenient for a system that wants efficiency. So we could tick a box to say, you know, um, uh, our video screens uh, are great and we have contact and that's very convenient. But the reality of it is for a young child who you know, doesn't pay uh, attention to a screen or whatever, um, you know, we have to think about these things. Uh, it goes in some way around um, and, and a lot. And also the acknowledgement, there's such a lot of effort and uh, resource goes into family visits. Whereas um, there are such a lot of prisoners without family or if they've got family, they're the reasons or part of the dysfunctional reasons that they're in there in the first place. And, um, and we look at addiction is the, the person suffering instead of what we know as practitioners, it's, actually, it's a family illness. You know what I mean? That it, it involves that family. So in, uh, we, yeah, it's really important. For me, it's about the cognitive behavioral support around peer-led support, around the 12-step fellowships or smart recoveries or whatever whatever's available uh, and allowing healthy attachments and a positive message to get across from prisoners returning into society. Yeah, because, you know, reality of it is family or no family uh, to recover from ad addiction is tough and people need to be prepared and armed with the facts about what they're about to face. So, Thanks, thanks, Mark. So I give the floor now for really a very short last comment to Blanca and Teano, if you want, please. Well, I, I wanted to say that Mark has uh, uh, really, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he hits the bull's eyes. It is true that the many of the prison and penitentiaries have, uh, so to speak, benefit uh, from the COVID situation and really uh, did, uh, you did uh, use this uh, situation to, uh, so to speak, uh, do not organize and uh, under under the. Uh, they use the situation to not uh, to to do not to uh, to try to, uh, so to speak, uh, try to hand uh, to this. Uh, issue of a video a video uh, call uh, as long as possible uh, there is 
uh, how to say a silent war between us, which are treat treatment personnel and the security officers. Uh, we in treatment personnel usually were saying uh, the video call is okay, but it is a short term. It's not normal and the prisoners have to have their families in physical way but the police officers uh, use this situation and said no so we are still struggling with them but uh, now since the epidemic situation is uh, better looking the visitations are uh, currently available but uh, it is something that we uh, are struggling with our colleagues not to use this situation and to to uh, not to provide our prisoners context with their family. So thank you, thank you, Blanca. Thank I you for to, this uh, last comment. Uh, thanks, and Teano. Yes. Well, as far as this uh, uh, communication is concerned, I must say that in Cyprus we managed to have. I think it's the only COVID-free zone in Europe, there was no other COVID-3, completely zero patients. And uh, I was trying to find out until when uh, the, one of the steps taken was no visit, no visit, but Skype calls were available. This is what I was trying to find, but I don't have it now. I think during the whole day, I mean, no limitation to that. So that helped a little bit in um, balancing the no visitations to um, uh, communicating. Uh, there was a gradual restoration of vis uh, visits, of course, but uh, there was uh, a checkup of people, of, of visitors, of workers, of everybody. Um, so at, it's admirable. There was no COVID symptoms in prison. Uh, mm -hmm. I need to make a final comment if I can, not concerning uh, communication. Um, as a civil lawyer, as I said, 20, maybe 25 years ago, I was defending this case against the government. I was a very young uh, lawyer working for the government. And um, there was a death from an overdose in prison. And I was so angry and called the prison department and said, and how did the drugs get into prison? It was unheard of. Uh, so many years later, of course, the, 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 real, the realization that this is what we maybe number one of what we need to tackle to attack is uh, very, very important. But the change in attitude, I'm sure not only in me, but in everybody dealing with such issues is uh, very interesting, I think. But we're talking 25 years ago, not uh, <laughs> that was one of my first cases. Th thank you very much. Teano also to finish up with the uh, personal experience, I think is always nice. So uh, thanks to all the speakers, but I will pass the floor to Marika. Just want, uh, would like also to thank, because I didn't mention the uh, national focal points that without them, we wouldn't have had all this data in the report. So please, Marika. No, I just would like to say that there were more questions we weren't able to answer, but we recorded them. So we will put the people asking in contact with our speakers so that they can go on with their... And also there was a very lively um, chat with also personal and felt experiences. It has been very, very interesting. Thank you all. Uh, I will, we had a good attendance, people remained until the end. Uh, I will launch a poll for our um, attendance to know their opinion. You don't need to remain. I know that you, you, we took a lot of your time already. Thank you everybody, really, it has been interesting and I hope we will have more opportunities to meet together and, and to reply to our uh, public. Thank you very much. <laughs>